The never-ending story follows Bastion, a sensitive kid who's having a hard time adjusting after the death of his mother. One day, Bastion hides out in an old bookstore to get away from some bullies and encounters every old person that has ever lived. The video arcade is down the street. Here we just sell small rectangular objects. They're called books. It's always nice to be reminded that old people are exactly the same regardless of what decade it is. I mean, sh just replace arcade machine with smartphone and boom, you have your 21st century reboot. The old man tempts Bastion with a book called The Neverending Story and hints that you can actually experience what is going on in that book. When his back is turned, Bastion steals the book, which is evidently his whole plan in the first place. He also could have just given Bastion the book, just in case Bastion wasn't a horrible little thief. So Bastion steals a book and leaves a note saying he'll bring it back. And then he skips school and hides out in the school to read said book. He is the worst juvenile delinquent ever. The book, The NeverEnding Story, begins with Rockbiter telling Nighthob and Teeny Weeny about a malevolent force overtaking Fantasia. Incidentally, Nighthob and Teeny Weeny were two nicknames that I had foisted upon me in high school, for reasons that we won't get into here. What you have told us is also happening where I live in the West. A strange sort of nothing is destroying everything. Oh, they're being affected by nothing? Well, problem solved then. <laughs> But in all seriousness, the nothing does threaten to destroy their entire existence. But I need to keep it light early on, cause it's gonna get heavy here pretty soon. Nothing begins to encroach on their camp, so they take off to see the Empress who herself has become ill because of nothing. They decide they need to enlist the aid of the great warrior Treyu to stop nothing. <laughs> and as great as that joke is, I think I'm gonna stop now. They're all shocked to learn that Atreyu is just a boy, but they decide to send him anyway. They don't know anything about the nothing, but they tell him that he has to go alone and he must leave his weapons behind. What the hell for, man? Exactly, Warren. I'm not sure why they feel that Atreyu is the only one that can do this. Just looking around this room, there's about a dozen creatures that could handle this way better. Not the least of which is the 50-foot tall rock monster. And Atreyu traveled for a week but could not find a cure for the Empress. Maybe because they didn't give him any information to go on. He doesn't even know what the Empress's illness is. Atreyu is also being hunted by a creature of darkness called the Gamork. Atreyu's quest directs him to the advisor Morla, the Ancient One in the Swamps of Sadness, and hopefully it's just an ironic name and nope. Fighting against the sadness, okay? Nope, the name is apt. Please, you're letting the sadness of the swamps get to you. You know what? No, it's too sad. Hold on, I'm gonna make some changes here. No, Atreyu, this is where I live. There is a secret elevator right under my feet that will take me back to my family. I'm going to stay with them where I'll live forever. And not, as some people have suspected, slowly suffocate as I try to gasp for air that has instead been replaced with noxious swamp ooze until I finally stop writhing in sheer agony, grateful for the sweet release of death. There, that's better. Much more palatable. After Atreyu leaves Artax, whom he'll be able to visit now that he knows where he lives, Atreyu comes upon Morla, and when he does, Bastion screams for basically no reason because Bastion is weird. But Atreyu and Morla are somehow able to hear his pathetic cries. School lets out, and instead of going home like a normal person, Bastion decides to stay in the creepy-ass attic of the school and finish reading the book he stole. For someone who likes to cut school, he sure does spend a lot of time there. Atreyu almost succumbs to the swamps of sadness, but is rescued by Falcor the Luck Dragon. My name is Falcor. And my name is- Atreyu. How'd you know that? You were unconscious. I rifled through your wallet. I hope you don't mind. I mean, I did save your life, but whatever. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> That's so good. Thank you. Oh man, I am so glad that dogs can't talk. I would never pet another dog again if they could describe how good it made them feel. <laughs> Not to mention all the things that your dog has probably walked in on you doing. And then he would just tell everybody. Why don't you sit down and be quiet for once? You keep quiet, Wedge. We all have married relatives that are just like these two miserable people. They really should get divorced, but this is the routine that makes them feel the most secure, so who are we to judge? Come on, lazy bones. Can't you go any faster? Ah, belittling your wife in front of strangers. So we learn that there are two trials before anyone can reach the Oracle. The Sphinx's eyes stay closed until someone who does not feel his own worth tries to pass by. The Sphinx's eyes stay closed until someone who does not feel his own worth tries to pass by. Oh man, imagine if every place had that. 
Like if all golden corrals had that at the front door, I'd never be able to eat a buffet again. And what if they had one for when you left? You know, if I was feeling good about myself when I got there, after eating my weight in fried shrimp and macaroni, there's no way I'd feel good enough about myself to get out. Really makes you think. And Atreyu makes it because, let's face it, he's a 14-year-old boy gawking at naked lady statues. Kids on cloud nine right now. Atreyu then makes it to the second trial, which is a mirror that confronts the user with their true self. And if we're being honest, no one in the 21st century will be able to handle being shown their true selves. We are all garbage people floating around on this garbage rock, living our garbage lives. Oh yeah, while you're here, hit, hit that subscribe button. Atreyu looks in the mirror and sees Bastion reading the book and... You stupid little jerk. That book is not yours. Atreyu easily makes it past the second trial and finally makes it to the Southern Oracle who tells Atreyu that the only way to save Fantasia is that a human child who lives beyond the boundaries of Fantasia has to give the Empress a new name. Does the Empress have a say in this? Uh, Falcor, there's a plane coming right for you. Uh, Tower, we have some sort of weird flying dog in our flight path. With luck. Oh my god, Falcor, <laughs> change course! Uh, Tower, I feel he may be on a kamikaze run. Pull up, man! Atreyu makes it to the boundaries of Fantasia and notices drawings depicting every leg of his journey. And Atreyu feels pretty skeeved out that some pervert has been watching this whole time. But he doesn't have time to file a formal complaint because the Gamork is waiting for him and the epic showdown can be and Gamork's dead. There was a lot of build up for this fight. So the Nothing finally destroys all of Fantasia and Atreyu succumbs to the vacuum of space and... Oh, he's alive. And the Ivory Tower is still standing and... Did, did Bastion just eat that entire apple? Core and all? Man, he's a weirdo. So the Empress begins to tell Atreyu all about Bastion and how he's the only one who can save Fantasia, which kind of negates Atreyu's whole journey. The Earthling child. The one who can save us all. So now hold on. The world of Fantasia is linked to our world and whomever is reading the never-ending story. So does the shop owner choose the Empress's name every time he reads it? And does it always need to be an earthling child? Or is that why the shopkeeper let Bastion have the book? Because he realized halfway through that the only way to save Fantasia was to have a child give the name. Where is he? He doesn't realize he's already a part of the never-ending story. They can't be talking about me. Bastion. Why don't you do what you dream, Bastion? Atreyu keeps wondering why the Earthling child won't do anything, and the Empress, who has been calling Bastion by name, says that the child doesn't realize that he's the one and that he just needs to call out her new name, and everything will be saved. Bastion, meanwhile, just straight up won't do it. But I can't! I keep my feet on the ground! You have been yelling randomly at this book for the last 13 hours, but now you think it's weird to just call out a name? Bastion finally decides to give in to the fantasy and runs to the window and screams... Moon pie hole? Munchausen oil? What? what kind of weird ass name you give her? So the general consensus online is that Bastion yells out Moon Child, but earlier in the movie Bastion is lamenting the fact that they don't ask him to name the Empress because his mother had such a beautiful name. Was his mom named Moonchild? So Fantasia is gone, but the Empress tells Bastion that he can wish it back into existence. And so what does Bastion do with all that power? Ho oh, ho! I can't kill anyone for you, I'm just a figment of your imagination. Oh, what the hell. 